Welcome to the Let's Talk series. The Let's Talk series is a 30 minute video discussion between myself, Dr. Becca, Dr. Amanda, and a local practitioner who understands pelvic health on topics pertaining to women's health and wellness. This series was created to help women navigate their pelvic health wherever they are on the path of womanhood, to advocate, navigate, and collaborate together with a holistic team of allies. Pelvic health healing is multidimensional and the best outcomes occur with a team-based approach. We invite you to tune into our monthly series to learn more about your pelvic health and engage with our community partners. So welcome today to just Dr. Amanda and I. Um, we're gonna be our speakers for today. We've done a few of these where it's just the two of us kind of chatting about things and we really, you know, we love getting to collaborate with all of our, our lovely colleagues in the area, but then every once in a while, um, Amanda and I have some, some things that are near and dear to our hearts or things that we've been working on in the office that we want to be able to share with you all. So today we will be discussing the topic before the first six weeks, the top three overlooked reasons birth workers need to be advocating for perineal trauma. Um, Dr. Amanda has been doing a lot of research um, on this topic lately, so she's got a lot of good stuff to share and things that we've been kind of starting to incorporate in the office with our clients, and we've been seeing some, you know, really great um, outcomes um, for that. So thank you, Dr. Amanda, for sharing your knowledge on this topic. Thank you, Dr. Becca. As always, it's just so um, exciting to be able to sit by, kind of by ourselves and talk about what we do in the office and what sets maybe us apart um, in how we, you know, think of pelvic health and how we're navigating pelvic health with our clients. And perineal trauma is one of those things that, and when we talk about perineal trauma, we're talking about like a grade one, two, three, four tear during birth, vaginal birth specifically. And we'll talk more in detail about that, but just so people know, and it's that tear or that slight, um, you know, the skin maybe pulls apart a little bit with a grade one, but anyway, perineal trauma was something in the very beginning of my career as a pelvic therapist that kind of confused me because it was like, oh, well, you know, when you talk to your clients, they're like, oh, I had a grade three tear, but the doctor says everything's okay. And just in my small mindedness of like, huh, well, when we talk about a grade three tear for a hamstring, right. you know, that included surgery or that included rest, or there was, you know, this progression as our fellow physical therapy and OT colleagues know that there's like passive range of motion, active, range, active assisted range of motion, then there's loading and all this other stuff. And there was a a protocol for things. And then when you come to the flip side of the perineum, having trauma, whether it's a perineal tear, or if there's even included a, levol a levator avulsion, there's like nothing to be said or done. There's no protocol. There's nothing. So right. that's what we're going to talk about today of, um, how can we as birth professionals, whether you're a PT, an OT, uh, specializing in pelvic floor therapy, whether you're um, a lactation consultant, seeing mom and baby very early on, or even a pediatric therapist who has been seeing babes for torticollis or something like that, has anybody ever asked mom, or even the nurses in the hospital or a nurse that comes to your home um, during the postpartum timeframe, how can we set ourselves up for success to have some guidelines to help our clients navigate a perineal tear. And as you'll find out, um, as we move along, yes, perineal tears have different grades, grade one through four, but we're going to talk even more specific to the grade three and the grade four tears, which are more involved, which are called obstetric anal sphincter injuries. Um, all the principles can be applied obviously to grade one, through grade four, but this is really specific to catching the, um, you know, the smaller percentage of women, about 44 to 11% of people of vaginal births will be an obstetric tear, an oasis. And we want to be able to catch them more efficiently. And by doing that, we can provide a more direct referral to urogynecology, which is a gynecologist who's even more trained and specialized, um, more so outside of gynecology and obstetrics, right. they're a urogynecologist. So they work in the urology department, bring that knowledge as well as the um, 
pelvic floor gynecological department, as well as how can we as pelvic therapists get to the right people to start the right education so people have a significant impact on their immediate healing, but also how does that translate into that whole first year? So a few quick things we're gonna talk about because spoiler alert, Dr. Becca and I are hosting um, a class in more detail about all of this work that we've been working on. But we're gonna talk about three things that we find are really important to, to do. So that'll be in November, that date will be released. Um, but we are just excited. But starting off, we're going to talk about, um, oh, we're going to talk about me for a second. Hold on. <laughs> if you don't know me. Um, I'm Amanda Heritage, physical therapist and owner of Breathe Life PT. Um, and just a little bit about me and my background, but I've been treating pelvic health now for, I'll be out of school 12 years. Yeah, this month. And then I guess pelvic therapy, like nine years, nine, 10 years at this point. Mm -hmm. So um just had a lot of time to walk a lot of paths with people. So anyway, so let's get started. So why is this so important to us? So in 2022, there was this huge joint publication that was um, put out by IUGA, which is like the International Urogynecologist Association, and then um, ICS, which is the International Continent Society. And they put this publication out. And one of their big statements was about perineal trauma. So they had, they talked about all different kinds of things, but they specifically talked about perineal trauma. And the underlying part here is really what gets me is that if you close your eyes as a provider, whether you're a physical therapist, OT, lactation consultant, nurse, you could put in other words here and you'd be like, oh yes, I know exactly what I would do with this client. So for example, if you're a physical therapist, if you even just put in the word hamstring, you're like, oh yeah, we know that there's a protocol for hamstring tears or sprains or strains of an ankle. So when we think about it, perineal, what they shared was perineal and vaginal, as well as anal, anal sphincter trauma following delivery are the most commonly described types of obstetric trauma, which we see quite often and why women more specifically come to pelvic therapy postpartum. However, there are different aspects of the pelvic floor that may be affected through tissue rupture, compression, stretching with associated nerve, muscle, and connective tissue damage. Now for us, anatomy nerds and physical therapists, we know, oh my gosh, of course, there's increase in vasculature, there's increase of lymphatic um, flow that has to happen with swelling and whatnot. There's stretch to the muscle fibers that can change how the muscle fibers communicate with the rest of the body. And we can say this again, I go back to my example of a hamstring tear, we would know exactly what to do. But we don't as physical therapists, specifically pelvic therapists, know kind of exactly what to do, or at least have guidelines of moving us forward. So when a joint publication like this is put out a big, by two big groups, we really need to be listening. It's lovely that they said this statement, but now as therapists, we need to be able to act, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to do this work early on because perineal trauma happens. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Um, we'll talk about why some reasons are and what some preventative things are to, you know, negate the perineal trauma potentially from happening. But 53 to 89% of, of birthing people experience perineal trauma. And in another research article, um, it talked about what people were emotionally feeling. They were feeling uncertain of what was normal for their tear. They were feeling uncertain of like, who provides support for this? Is it just my gynecologist or are there fairies like pelvic therapists who know what they're doing? Um, a lot of the time women also feel under-prioritized as the doctors and nurses and everybody are coming in and checking on babe. Well, what about checking mom? Yes, her blood pressure is good. Her heart rate's good. But what about her perineum? How's that even healing in the first few days um, in the hospital or being at home? And then um, a lot of the time people feel that their, their concerns are not taken very seriously. And we see this quite often with our clients who are given the grade three, grade four diagnosis of a perineal tear that it's like, well, they just kind of said, hey, it's six weeks, it's time to have sex. And everyone's like, is it even healed down there? Can it tolerate anything? And there's no continuation of that conversation, unfortunately. Um, and here's a biggie, the lack of continuity of care from birth to home. So we really want to try to be promoting as much education as possible. 
So one of our dear clients gave birth at a hospital. Oh my gosh. It will almost be a year soon. And she did have a fourth degree tear. And yes, she did see us prior to therapy, but there were a lot of different interventions and different things that, that might have promoted the tearing. And obviously we want mom and babe to be safe. So we can't hold it against anybody or against ourselves as, as birthing humans, but there are things that happen. And when you go through such a trauma, and you're in the days of that trauma and giving birth, there's so many things that just don't feel like they connect. And I thought one of the big things of what she had shared as she expressed some of her story was that she had the nurses come in and talk to her at 4 a.m. and talk about perineal wound healing. And then that was kind of it. And it was like, oh, lactation came in, they're doing lactation stuff. And there was there was no visit from anybody else specific to a grade four tear. Yes, the OB said, okay, good, you've got a tear, everything's healing, stitches are intact, but there was no communication of how do I sit? How do I stand? How do I hold this baby to breastfeed? What's my peeing and pooping gonna look like? Why is this gas coming out of my backside and I have no control? All those things. And from her understanding, she's like really a follow-up with somebody specific, like a PT or an OB nurse regarding all of that would have been so helpful because really to be seen would have helped her tremendously, especially when she just, she shared, she felt like a vessel whose bottom half was no longer needed. Mm -hmm. Holy mackerel. That bottom half was so important to give birth to this babe. And then as soon as babes out, it's like, oh, I kind of felt like no one else cared about the bottom of my vessel. And it's like, no, that vessel is so important because it's going to hold up. Help is going to hold up mama for, you know, the long nights and the long days of breastfeeding and sitting or peeing and pooping. So we really need to be mindful of, of how we're addressing perineal tears early on. And obviously we're not in the hospital, but maybe that'll be something we can change someday. Fingers crossed. So anyway, birth related trauma and from Dr. Becca in her course um, that she has both an online course and an in-person workshop about perineal tears or preparing your perineum for birth. We talk about some things that would minimize the occurrence of, of tearing. Do you want to share a few of those things, Becca? Yeah. Um, I think, you you know, the, the, how in, that would be yeah, in, in the research and some of the, the studies, I think, um, you know, the, the number one factor that is, is kind of at play of whether or not, um, you will leave with an intact perineum is kind of what they're calling, um, is who you choose as your provider. Um, and I think that's so, so important. Um, you know, as far as having a relationship with someone who you trust, there's open lines of communication. You feel like you can, kind of, um, you know, have a conversation with them versus them saying like, okay, well, this, this, and this is what we're going to do. This is how we do it. Da, da, da. Um, and just feeling like you're able to advocate for your needs and kind of understand that. Um, but also knowing, um, you know, if you are birthing at a hospital, you know, you can, you can look up or you can ask what are your rates of episiotomy or what are your rates of tears or what are your emergency C-section rates? You can look all of that stuff up and kind of also almost interview your provider, um, you know, and, and, and see, um, kind of what their stats are, right. so to say, and maybe in certain scenarios, you know, what do they feel most comfortable with? with doing, I can't remember, I think we had a client who, oh, in, in one of the previous classes that we did, you know, there was a situation where they were thinking they needed to use some intervention and, um, you know, they were trying to decide between two, two different things. And she was, she was, you know, she asked a great question, which we thought we're like, wow, that's amazing. Cause she asked, well, what are you most comfortable with, or what is your like expertise in? Yeah. Right. So sometimes even knowing that beforehand might be helpful of like, okay, in this scenario where there is like an, an obstructed labor or something, and we're having to use maybe like an instrument, um, you know, what is, <laughs> what do you feel comfortable, most comfortable with using, knowing that an instrumental delivery is going to be an increased kind of risk, um, depending on other factors involved with that too. So, um, and you know, there's, there's OBGYNs versus midwives, there's different settings that you can birth into and kind of knowing all the statistics and kind of 
your values and what you feel most comfortable with um, being able to kind of connect yourself with with someone who you trust. Um, you know, I think trust is like the biggest piece Absolutely. of it um, and people leaving feeling like no matter what happened that it's, you know, they're okay with what happened because it was a mutual kind of decision made together, not mm. something that just like, oh, all of a sudden all these people were rushing in and telling me to do all this stuff and flipping me one way and flipping me the other. Like we've heard those stories of like, yeah. they have no idea what's going on. They're just being like tossed around. So, um, so yeah, your provider is a big determinant of that. Um, movement during labor is very helpful. Um, you know, switching positions, um, being in more kind of like upright positions to help gravity allow baby to kind of descend down, um, tends to be more protective and more helpful, um, to allow naturally your body to just go through that process. Um, and regardless of if you have an epidural or not, there are still positions that you can get into that will facilitate kind of that, um, you know, baby progressing through, um, and ways that you can move. And we have a lot of, um, birth workers in the area who teach a lot of those classes of how to move through labor, um, that can be very helpful as well. Um, perineal massage prenatally, which, um, you can learn you from a pelvic therapist. Um, you know, we teach that here with a lot of our clients who feel comfortable and open to, to that sort of thing, um, as a way to not only prepare the tissues and protect your perineum, but a way to just connect in with your body and your, your pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. um, using a warm compress at the perineum um, in between pushes was something that found was found to be helpful. Um, I'm trying to think, I know you have some of the ones yeah. here as far as things that increase your risk, but those mm -hmm. are some of the things that decrease um, your risk. So exactly. Yeah. So talking about what increases birth related traumas during the birthing process. So some of those things we can do that Dr. Becca was speaking of, you can do during your preparations, you can do during um, early phases of labor and, and movement. Um, but this is like during that like final push in, from second stage to like yes. final birth, right? So we hope that every person has the birth that they desire, but sometimes that does not occur. And natural tearing and episiotomies do need to occur. And <clears throat> they are classified by degrees. We're going to talk about that in a minute based on the severity and the extent of the tear. But the things that can cause, have a causation for the tear would be prolonged second stage labor, meaning the birthing mama is pushing for 90 minutes. And then after that 90 minutes, every additional 30 minutes of pushing, there's an increased risk of tear by 23%. So when we hear people who say, um, you know, they were pushing for three hours as providers, it's really important to get to the like nitty gritty of like, well, were you pushing? And then was like baby's head moving in and out? Were you just pushing and nothing was happening? So we kind of want to know because when someone says, three hours, four hours, it's like, whoa, there's probably more issues that are going to happen there, not just with a tear, but also tissue elasticity, tissue tens tensegrity, there we go, um, and how that all moves together. So that's one thing. Um, instrumental delivery, we do know that using instruments does increase a risk, but the risk of forceps being involved is higher, higher, has a higher association with oases, as well as the levator ani avulsion. And that means the levator ani avulsion is actually where part of the pelvic floor muscle either comes off a little bit of the pubic bone, whether it's a partial avulsion, a full avulsion, it could happen on all of the other bony segments that the levator ani muscles are connected to more so it's closer to the pubic bone, but there are other occasions where maybe it's at the ischial spine or at the coccyx or something like that. So we know that forceps is um, a big push too for a tear. The absence of an epidural, the epidurals are helpful obviously for pain management um, and uh, symptom management, but the 
um, rate at which the babe's head is moving and pushing into that perineum, the epidural does slow that down. So for some people that can have a protective mechanism um, to actually slow the speed versus we have had mamas who are like, oh, I pushed for 15 minutes. And when they say they were pushing for 15 minutes, it was like, I was pushing in my car and then I was pushing in the triage and then baby was out and I had a grade three tear. And it's like, Sometimes the rate that baby comes out doesn't allow those pelvic floor muscles to elongate and go into those kind of stretch, relax, stretch, relax factors, relaxing factors. And then one of the other ones that does happen um, when babies are obstructed potentially in the birth canal for different reasons is where they actually push on the mom's fundus of the uterus. So like the doctor or nurse would be pushing on the belly, helping to mechanically move baby through the birth canal. And that has an increased risk of levator ani as, or levator ani um, avulsion as well. So those are the things that can promote um, a grade three or a grade four tear. And then when we're talking, like I said, when we're talking about <clears throat> um, perineal trauma, like I said, there's four grades and grade one is more of like the superficial skin. Like here, you can see on this picture, just the skin with the little small tear that's there. And then a grade two is the skin, some of the vaginal mucosa, and some of the pelvic floor muscle does have a tear as well. Both, it can be superficial and a little bit of the deep pelvic floor muscle. But then when we cross over to grade three, it gets split into three more categories for you to memorize. We'll keep it basic for now that the external anal sphincter is involved. So it's the vaginal muscles around the opening of the vagina and then through the perineal body and then into the external anal sphincter, that cute little pucker of your backside. Um, and then <clears throat> the internal anal sphincter, as we get higher up into grade 3B and 3C, there is some internal anal sphincter, which is a muscle much higher up, as you can see in this picture here next to the rectum, the muscle much higher up, which is actually more of a smooth muscle that we do not control voluntarily, that can have um, some involvement. And then a grade four would be um, a, a full tear of both the external and internal anal sphincter. And that can also have rectal uh, mucosa involvement. And we tend to find that there's a lot more that we need to set people up for understanding with a grade four, or grade three, three or four tear. So from here on out, I'm going to try to call it an OASA or OAC. So meaning obstetric anal sphincter injury. So when you hear sphincter, you know that grade three or grade four are involved. So just a quick review of a few things that Dr. Becca and I are going to share. When we're talking about OAC symptoms, and this is something that I, I really, I noticed in the beginning of my practice, but I didn't know what was happening, that people who have the symptoms of OASIS have more anal incontinence symptoms. And that doesn't just mean, oh, I get the urge to go to the bathroom and I'm leaking stool. It could also be that they're having um, gas passage without knowing it. So there's more of rectal related symptoms that people experience having an obstetric anal sphincter tear. And I think one thing that people do notice in the very beginning um, within those first six weeks, they're like, oh my gosh, I get the urge to go to the bathroom and I'm literally pooping myself on the way. Or they don't get the urge to go to the bathroom and they're like, um, I think I just went poop in my own pants. Like I need a diaper just like my child does. So those things can happen. Or people experience, you, they might experience that. And then as they start to get better, as the body does its healing and stuff, they start to get better. They're like, why am I just passing gas all the time? And that could even be at six months, nine months later, they're like, I have no control. So those are the things I like to share and tell people we need to be hearing these things right now within those first days and within those first six weeks, because when people have these symptoms, these colorectal symptoms, they are associated, we know research-wise, they're associated to a longer duration of that second stage labor, which we already know a longer duration of second stage labor increases the risk of OACs, but that also can increase their colorectal symptoms. So we want to have, if you're a birth doula, if you're a PT that's involved in, in the 
the labor and delivery room. You want to be able to document this so people can understand, okay, at three months, this is probably what I'm going to expect, or this is how far I've come. And this PFDI CRAD score correlation, this is a, a functional measure scale that physical therapists or pelvic therapists utilize to glean information from our clients related to prolapse or urinary um, changes or colorectal changes. But the cool part is in research, we can kind of create a path and show people how their symptoms are changing and when they're changing, not when, but how they're changing and the amount of change that they're having if we utilize this early on for our clients with um, the an, an OAC tear. And this is something that I think all of us should be doing, whether you are a doula and you don't have the clinical background to understand this, even just asking your clients these questions and then say, hey, I really think that you need to see a physical therapist or pelvic therapist and I'll send this to them or you can take this with them or take this with you to your appointment. And it's just starting to create, um, like I said, a baseline because a lot of the time it feels so confusing as people are moving forward of like, well, what was my normal? What is normal for just having a baby? Should I be passing gas without knowing? Um, my mom still passes gas three years later or 30 some years later, I'm not saying my mom, I'm not embarrassing my mom, but I'm saying some people <laughs> hear their parents or their, their mothers or their aunts say, oh, I still pass gas so many years later. It's like, oh, well, that is not normal. But sometimes we believe those things to be normal. Have you heard those things? Becca? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. A lot of times clients are like, my mom should come like, yeah. or, or the, that's the reason they're here because they're like, my mom has all these issues and I don't want to end up with the same thing. Correct. Right. So, yeah. yeah. So I think another thing that we found really interesting in some of the research um, classes that we've been taking part on is that the grading of an oasis is actually challenging. Um, if you think about all of the stuff that goes on during labor and birth, there might be fluids that are being pumped through mama um, for hydration and blood pressure management. There might be... Um, prolonged pushing, that there's swelling that occurs. It's hard to see. Yes, there's a tear, but we don't always know the, the absolute degree of the tear initially. Um, but when the doctors or the OBs are doing a diagnosis, it should be performed right after birth. And there should be one finger that moves vaginally and one finger that moves rectally to feel the space and the thickness of the muscle of the perineal body and the levator ani muscles there. And not performed at delivery. There also is many times that we refer to one of the urogynecologists in the area for clients to have is an endoanal ultrasound. And that's something we can start to have like on our radar to provide support for our clients that there's more to testing and grading their tear than what they experienced maybe an hour after giving birth um, vaginally. And I think the big things to recognize here are that one in 10 women are actually underclassified, that a lot of the time they had a higher defect rate than what was originally diagnosed. So someone who's diagnosed a grade two tear may actually be a grade three A. And it's difficult to, like I said, difficult to understand. I don't do it, obviously, but there are, there's research that says many clinicians do um, miss a internal anal sphincter injury, specifically when it goes from like a grade three A, B, and it really is a grade three C, four. But we start to pick up on those things in the, in the office when someone comes to us more um, in an appropriate fashion, closer to that six weeks. Um, and then some people are overdiagnosed and that happens too. There is a discrepancy between midwives and OBs of who classifies incorrectly or who is a little bit more accurate. So that's really interesting. But when someone does sustain a grade three or a grade four tear at three months, I do expect that they are seeing somebody to give them more information about that tear, especially if it's symptomatic. So on the side, this black and white lovely ultrasound picture is a grade, um, let's see, this top one is like a grade one or a grade two. This white arrow points to a little stretch. You can see that there's a change between the outer circumference of the external anal sphincter muscle. 
And then the bottom picture is actually a grade four tear. And you can see that the black kind of horseshoe shape is the internal anal sphincter. And then the other um, kind of whitish horseshoe shape on the outside is the external anal sphincter. And you can see that they are both, the ends of them where the arrows are, are both separated. So that would be a grade four tear. And this is information we can see on an ultrasound that specialists can provide, especially if somebody's having continuation of symptoms, it might be like, oh, hey, maybe we need to find out, is this really what we think it is? We'll talk a little bit more about this in our coursework, but carrying on um, as providers who are seeing our birthing moms immediately, that therapeutic education is so, so important. That as we're helping our clients understand what's going on in the very beginning is ultimately helping them at one year postpartum. We're allowing them to understand the norms of what they are expecting that yes, at one year postpartum, a persistent defect in the internal anal sphincter with a combination and or a combination of external anal sphincter and internal anal sphincter injury at a higher risk for anal incontinence in women with isolated external anal sphincter so, um, injury. So we know, like I said, whether it's that gas that's randomly passing and people are like, well, where'd that come from? Or the bowel incontinence or bowel urgency or lack of bowel urgency. Those are things that if someone's experiencing early postpartum, we can set them up and say, hey, this will get better, but we need to be looking at long-term of how do we set yourself up to see a colorectal specialist, to see a urogynecologist, to see a pelvic therapist, to minimize that risk of having those symptoms later on. And little shout out to us as pelvic therapists. There's been some research, some preliminary research that shows people who worked with a pelvic floor therapist starting at week two, which gynecologists do and OBs do not refer clients to us until after six to eight weeks, right? The only time we've ever really seen people coming to see us at week two or three was because they were previously our clients and they texted us and said, hey, I had a tear, I'm coming in to see you, or can you come see me, or what do I do, how do we manage this? But what would happen if everyone was with a OAC tear was referred to pelvic therapy at two weeks? They would have a significant improvement in pelvic floor symptoms and bother of symptoms compared to those who started at six weeks. So there really is this importance of time in the very beginning that we can, um, you know, support. Again, another uh, research had shared that starting rehab within 30 days, which could be like four weeks versus the traditional six weeks, again, doing specific things, even just four within four visits, but specific things that us as pelvic therapists know by sharing, hey, can you sit, com how do we get you to sit comfortably? Can you do some gentle pelvic floor contractions? Could you do some breathing? Maybe we need to recommend colace or, or um, sitting differently for managing constipation um, and helping them eliminate appropriately. We can help by providing simple, simple things in the home. And you don't have to be a pelvic therapist to do it. You could be a lactation consultant that says when you're sitting and, bre and breastfeeding or pumping, maybe we can try sitting in this position. And these are all the things that Becca and I are going to share in our coursework where you're a doula and you're seeing somebody three times a week. You could have them just help support them by uh, having them avoid heavy lifting. You could also say, hey, I want you to try lying flat like this for a little while. That would help with some swelling. And those are all the things we want to equip you with because again, early um, pelvic floor muscle therapy after a vaginal birth with an oasis has a benefit to prevent gas leakage, stool leakage, and urinary incontinence. So we really want to see more of us doing, not just the pelvic therapist, um, more of us doing some, some good things. So Another one, core pressure management, obviously that belly gets bigger. Obviously there's a huge stretch of the core in the pelvic floor. There's a lot of hormonal shifts and a lot of change in the collagen that happens um, within the body. And recognizing that the pelvic floor isn't just a pelvic floor and lives on its own. No, it's a part of a system. So we can 
encourage the core, the abdominal wall um, to also be supported. So one of our favorite things is doing um, some kind of belly binding. Um, there's wonderful doulas out there who do the beautiful, like, um, I want to say ribbons. It's not ribbons. Scarf. Thank you. The scarf. <laughs> and they do the belly binding and it's a beautiful ceremony as well, but they teach you how to, to support the, the abdominal wall um, by giving you some fabric support, but something even as simple as like an ace bandage appropriately wrapped around the abdomen, belly scarves, um, even this postpartum binder that this model is, is wearing for us starting at day two is super beneficial because it shares that it helps the belly and core muscles with their endurance within the first month of postpartum, which is really awesome to, to know. So if we're helping another part of the pelvic floor and its system, we're probably helping many more things um, at the level of the pelvic floor too. So again, there's many other types of binders um, that people can use, but also other support garments. Do you have a recommendation list as a doula if somebody is having um, changes to their, their vasculature or they're having so much swelling from a long birth, from that longer second stage labor? Do we know what things to recommend um, to support the body and the pelvis initially, but then also to support healing beyond that six weeks. Again, simple things like, can you encourage a client to blow before you go? That's a Julie Weeb thing. Breathe out before you move your body um, to improve the amount of pressure that's going, or to minimize the amount of pressure that's going down onto the pelvic floor, even with something as simple as getting up out of a chair, lifting baby out of a bassinet, holding baby while you're sitting down. So many things that we can just give support for an education so that people can feel a lot better. And again, there's so many things that we can talk about and we will talk about um, in our course, but to start off or not to start off, but keeping it in a perspective of when we're talking about OAC and a perineal trauma, we want to be observing and hearing their story. We can help them kind of start to navigate that story if we're using the questionnaire that we talked about up at the top of how much maybe gas they're feeling past or maybe how much um, discomfort they're having with bowel movements or how much bowel urgency they're having. We can then encourage them to secure their physiology by using some belly binding and some compression garments. Because again, we're not just focusing on just the pelvic floor. We're looking at the pelvic floor as part of a whole system and we're healing the whole system as well as how do they use their self-care techniques, their breath work, whether it's getting up and down out of a chair or holding baby to wound healing. Wound healing is a very small snippet of what happens in the hospital, but do we know as providers who are seeing the, the, the gals postpartum, do we know how to say, hey, here's how to use a peri bottle. Here's how you can sit. Here's how you could use a little um, sits bath. Do we know how to support that? Because there might be things that look different from our clients who have experienced a grade one or a grade two tear versus our clients who experience a grade three or a grade four tear. And we don't always know that until we have the experience, but to be able to join um, and support with multiple providers um, would be really helpful um, for the long-term outcome of our clients. So because I love the Golden Girls, I, I do have to give just a quick brief, um, <laughs> so not, uh, just thank you to um, the ERAD team, Enhanced Recovery After Delivery. It's a group that I work with who it's run by Dr. Rebecca and Dr. Jenna Seagraves. They're both wonderful physical therapists um, and pelvic therapists who are promoting maternal health in the hospital earlier than six weeks. So huge shout out to them for creating programs like this or starting to create programs like this around the country. Um, Pelvic Guru for all of those lovely illustrations. Dr. Becca, of course, for helping me understand 
the research because I hear things once, twice, 50 million times and Becca just gets it from the beginning. So she always helps <laughs> me to understand it um, just in very simple terms. And then Taryn Hallam is another physiotherapist in Australia who has been um, providing workshops to review what is the most up-to-date research. And part of that was about perineal trauma. And then my honorary board of PTs, and you gals know who you are because you always um, support us no matter what. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen, but yeah, so those are, that's just like a snippet of what we're going to talk about in our course um, in November, but it, hopefully it just provided some insight, even just to start utilizing with some of your clients who we know June, July, and August are big birthing months in South Jersey. At the time we're recording this, it's July. And we know that those babies are coming. So there's going to be, you know, as we learned four to 11% might be sustaining an oasis and how can we help them heal to help them then navigate all of those changes of what their new norm might be, as well as, um, impact their long-term function and their long-term healing mentally, physically, and emotionally from having an oasis tear. So, yeah. That was great. I Thank like, you. I, I feel like, I mean, I've seen, or we've talked about this stuff, I've seen it a few times. I feel like every time I like get a little different kind of things pulled exactly. from it. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I think some of the like main drive home points are, you know, like the early detection and care is yes. really key to like the long-term mm -hmm. outcomes. So, um, you know, oftentimes we encourage with a lot of our clients, if they tell us they had a grade three or grade four tear, we are directly referring immediately to a urogynecologist to make sure that everything, you know, all of the repairs and revisions were done um, appropriately. Correct. Um, or we're screening for some of those things. Maybe someone said, I had a grade, oh, I was pushing for three hours, the, you know, this, this, and this. I had a grade two tear. So then we're asking more of those like screening questions to make sure, you know, okay. Some, something did not get missed um, in those early weeks. And I think a lot of times there's a lot going on in those first few weeks, but it is focused on the baby. So you yes, might not even really be is. asking yourself these questions of how am I doing and right. that. So yeah, anyone who comes in contact with mom within those you know first kind of six weeks, um, I think pediatricians have a great opportunity for so this because they're seeing them so often yes. <laughs> with a baby. Um, right. yeah, I had a, a friend of mine who just gave birth. She took her son to the pediatrician and he was like, he spent the time and asked me like, how are you doing? That's so amazing that's like hear. a sign of a great pediatrician too. So, right. um, I think that, you know, just the early detection and care is, is key to the long-term exactly. outcomes. And hopefully over the next five, 10, 15 years, we'll be seeing more and more PTs in the acute care settings and um, helping these mamas get moving. Exactly. And I think, you know, when you were just saying that about like thinking of, you know, who we're referring to, too, I think a lot of people have a misconception that pelvic therapists are in your vagina all the time <laughs> and from day one till the time you're discharged. And that's not what we have to do or might not even be appropriate to do within those first six weeks. And I'll be completely honest for our processing and our philosophy at Breed Life PT, we do not do any internal pelvic floor muscle assessing until that gynecological examination that says, yes, everything's clear. There's no infection, nothing like that. But I think we have forgotten that when you become a pelvic therapist, you, you forgot all the stuff you learned in acute care, doing your acute care clinical and all that stuff. No, like we still know how to do body mechanics. We still know how to help someone sit comfortably, stand comfortably, move safely, even if it looks very different than what they were doing before. Or maybe it looks very different from doing like squats with a kettlebell, but no, we can do the, the I don't want to say very basic, but the very... Fundamental. 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 Thank you. The <laughs> fundamental thing that if you've been a, a geriatric physical therapist or an OT that you probably do all day, every day, but you can apply that just as much for our prenatal antenatal population. So um, I think for people out there to understand that we don't 
just look at the vagina all the time. Yes, it's an important place to look, but there's so much more that goes into the whole body healing. So that's one thing to really understand. And I think that's why a lot of our, our other supporters in the area, like lactation consultants and like doulas, don't refer to us until afterwards, because there is this misconception that PTs don't treat or work with somebody until they can do and manage um, internal mm -hmm. pelvic floor muscle work. Yeah. And even just wound healing in general, you know, oh how many clients after even giving birth without a tear, they're afraid to look at their vulvas. Right. Exactly. So but that can be really important to make sure that the healing is actually right. you know, going well and there's, you know, no breakdown or that sort exactly. of thing. So, you know, even us being able to, you know, externally observe kind of the wound and make sure things are on the right track for healing. Um, especially if there's the fear of a lot of people are like, I don't want to look. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, it's, I think it's very important to, um, you know, again, just the early detection of, of anything is exactly is the long-term outcomes. So exactly. we'll look at your vulvas if you want. No. Yeah. We had a, we had a great couple that we were able to work with and they, they both were therapists of some kind. So like they understand what everything's yeah. doing, but one of the partners, uh, the partner got out like this massive, like industrial flashlight. So we <laughs> all could observe the perineum and see at like week two, what the perineum was doing. And it was great to like, see like the before at week two. And then now almost like, like a year or so later, be like, wow, like your perineum has come so far or, oh yeah, there, there's still that little scar tissue there that, that was that stitch that was a little off in the beginning. And, you know, just to put it all together. So anyway, yeah, yeah. but was, yeah. Yeah. And it is helpful. Um, so I remember that client, like you were seeing her during her pregnancy mm -hmm. as well. Um, even knowing like, okay, pre-birth, what did your like vulva look right. like versus what is sometimes we see people and I'm like, well, I don't know what your vulva looks like right. before. Is this normal? And they're like, I don't mm -hmm. know. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, it's, um, I think it's very, it's a scary time, but I think be. the more people you have in your, your corner kind of supporting and advocating for you. Exactly. Um, you know. And before the six weeks, sporting and advocating for you yes. before the six weeks when yes. it is so mind, it's like an out of body experience as per my sister's um, words, you know, and, and, and seeing those transitions that happen within the first one, two, three, four into five, six weeks, there's a lot that the brain is processing. So to have somebody prepared and ready to whether it's say stop at your home or to have an appointment ready that you just show up and then we just go through different things um, that would help manage these big transitions with those fundamental movements or just small things that make a big difference in healing mm -hmm. is, is totally invaluable. So hopefully we um, will see more of us therapists and, and even other birth supporters and birth providers, um, you know, with us in our class in November. Um, if not, hopefully there's just more therapists that are working with their surrounding community and trying to get the word out there in different ways too. But maybe someday we'll get to infiltrate some of the hospitals with some of this <laughs> stuff too. So yes. yes, one girl can dream. But truly, anyway, truly a navigate, collaborate and advocate. <laughs> Absolutely. Well yeah. said. So thank you, Becca. Thank you.